Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. And the King James text today reads, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime, or asphalt as it were, had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. Now listen. And now nothing will be restrained from them uh, which they have imagined to do. Amen. Genesis 11, verses 1 through 6. If you bow your heads with me one more time. Master, King, Savior, Redeemer. Father, we love you, God, today. The word of God that you placed in my spirit for this hour is perhaps the most important message I will deliver in this lifetime. Oh, Master, if ever I have needed the anointing and the touch of the Holy Ghost, I need it now. Right now, God, I tear down every wall, every obstacle, every partition, that man would build, that would prevent them from hearing and receiving that which you would now deliver to the people of God and to the people of this great nation. Master, in the name of Jesus, open hearts, open minds, open spirits that people might receive from you today this word. For I believe, God, that I deliver a mandate. I deliver a message from the very throne room of grace at this moment in time. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Never in the history of our world has there been so much division and separation and warring and fighting and derision, at least in the United States of America as we see it today, and grossly, grotesquely, all this negativity and all this ungodliness because, honey, I got news for you today. All this division and derision is ungodly. This is not in keeping with a holiness standard. This is not how God's people are called to behave and how they're called to conduct themselves. And anyone that would tell you otherwise is lying through their teeth. God has called His people to be a people of peace. God has declared on the mountainside as thousands stood by and listened to God manifest in the flesh. Delivering a sermon we call today the Beatitudes. And God Himself spoke to us and said, Blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they shall inherit the earth. Not the dividers, not those today who would sow discord, not those today who would uh, 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 who would use hatred and division as their currency, but those who would seek to bring peace. The Word of God declares that through Jesus Christ our Lord, God has delivered to us reconciliation between ourselves and Him. And the Word of God also tells us today that God has called us to the ministry of reconciliation. You see, everywhere there's divisiveness, everywhere there's separation, everywhere there's division, everywhere there's malice and hatred, everywhere there's negativity, Christians are supposed to be bringing things together. We're supposed to be agents of reconciliation, bringing together. We're supposed to be agents of peace. We're supposed to be agents of love. We're supposed to be agents of uh, calm, meekness, that is self-control. And yet in the church in America today, we see none of these things. None of them. And yet people claim to be leaders in the evangelical and fundamentalist communities. And they're not leaders. They are false prophets, my friend, who are leading the people of God down an unholy, ungodly path that is going to end in utter destruction. There is a way that seemeth right unto man. But the end thereof is destruction. There are too many idiot preachers in our country today, and I'll name them Franklin Graham, for one, mm -hmm. who are preaching a message that seems right to men. The Word of God said in the last days, the church would heap unto itself teachers having itching ears. The church would heap up. These people don't claw and climb their way up to a place of prominence and power. No, 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 no. The grassroots are literally raising these people up and elevating them. And that is what the modern church has done with all these TV preachers. They think if somebody can get enough money to be on TV, that surely they must be telling the truth. Surely they must be anointed of God. Surely they must be blessed of God. Stupid. Stupid. Got news for you, honey. Satan has access to an awful lot of money. And he knows where to put it because he knows I don't need to deceive the masses. All I need to do is deceive the leader of the masses. If I can deceive the leader, then I will cause the fall of all who follow him or her. And this is what he's done. The Bible said in the last days, there would arise false prophets, wolves in sheep's clothing, who would make merchandise of the people of God and we are living in that hour and yet people in the church are too stinking ignorant and too foolish and too uh, I don't even know what words to put to it uh, too devoid of a knowledge of the word of God that they don't even realize hey wait a minute if we're living in the last days then this is as much true as anything else is true am I telling the truth right the Bible said by reason of these false prophets, many would be deceived. Many! Not a few. Don't look at this old preacher in Dallas, Texas and say, oh, he's a false prophet. 
He's preaching a false message. Honey, I got news for you today. If every person that listened to me and every person that watched me were deceived out of their mind, it wouldn't add up to a hill of beans. But you look at a man like Franklin Graham. You look at a man like Kenneth Copeland. You look at these preachers today who were motivated by nothing but a love for money, wealth, prosperity. Who were in love with their big houses. Who were in love with their jewelry and their fancy cars and their aeroplanes. And then you wonder why they preach the message they preach. You wonder why they support the political figures that they support. I'll tell you why. Because they're as carnal and as earthly and as fleshly as anybody can be, honey. And they are every bit as, uh, as invested in government protecting their money as the wealthiest man on this planet is. And yet, there are wealthy men on this planet. There are men of great wealth, tremendous wealth, who invest enormous sums in philanthropy and they give to charity and they help those who are in need. And you look at somebody like Bill Gates and I uh, 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 wish I could remember this other fellow's name, but they've invested so much money uh, in response to this COVID situation. You know, they've put so much money into it. And yet we have Christians who were loaded with money. I hadn't heard a word about how many millions of dollars Kenneth Copeland has given to help in this COVID crisis. Haven't heard one word about it. Yet he claims to be a billionaire. His own mouth has uttered the words, he is a billionaire, not a millionaire. Satan knows that in the last days the easiest way to destroy the church listen to me and the easiest way to destroy a marriage and the easiest way to destroy a family and the easiest way to destroy a relationship and the easiest way to destroy a nation is through Division. There's something about people getting together and working together toward one common cause and one common goal. I'm going to tell you, according to God's own lips, there is nothing they cannot do. If you look at our primary text today, verse number 6, the word of the Lord said, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, meaning to build this tower, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. See, there are a lot of, I guess the best way I could say it is affirmative messages in the Word of God. In other words, you read it, and very clearly you understand that there's a message coming at you telling you something directly. There are very uh, many direct messages and we are when when Jesus said love one another this is my commandment that ye love one another well obviously that's direct but I'm going to tell you there are a lot of truths in the word of God which come at us in an indirect fashion and preachers preach on these indirect messages all the time but I grew up in the Pentecostal church, and I've got to tell you, I don't think I've ever heard a preacher in my lifetime. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think I've ever heard a preacher in my lifetime 
talk about the indirect message that God delivered to us through Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, particularly verse 6. What is God indirectly telling us? God is indirectly telling us that when people unite as one, there is nothing, listen, nothing, listen. Oh, I, I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you sit there and stew in it for a minute. There is nothing they can imagine that they cannot do. There's a secular author, I believe it was H.G. Wells, who made the observation. He said, I believe that there is nothing that man's imagination can conjure that we do not have the ability to do. Now, we may imagine it far sooner than we have the tools to accomplish it, but he said, but there is nothing we can imagine that we are not ultimately capable of doing. My goodness, what does that do for those who, who have often mused today about issues or topics like time travel. Ooh. Think about it. We have movies that have been made about time travel, right? Back to the future. Marty, quick, get in the car. If we can imagine it, it can be done. Not only did H.G. Wells say that, but well, listen to me now, so did God. The only thing that is required to accomplish any given task is to tap into the power of one. The Word of God declares, and the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. And they have all one language. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you know the story of the Tower of Babel. I didn't read the entire text. I didn't read the entire story. Because the rest of the story is not important to what God has given me to deliver to the people of America and to the uh, people of God's church today. The power of one. Now, before some... Strongly brain wit jumps up and says, Oh, bless God, he's preaching a message of one universal church. He's preaching unity. And uh, we're supposed to throw all our convictions away. We're supposed to throw all our beliefs away so we can have one world in one church in one country. No, this preacher's not preaching that at all. Not even close. Not even close. But there are certain things that require that the people be united as one. One of those things, my friend, today is the ongoing mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If God's church doesn't get its head out of its backside and start thinking with a clear mind, we are going to fail miserably in our responsibility and in our calling to preach the gospel to all four corners of the earth. Because I got news for you today. We got more missionaries in the world than we ever have had. But I promise you, probably 90% of them are not preaching the biblical gospel. They're preaching a gospel. They're not preaching the gospel and the word of God declares this gospel must first be published in all the world this gospel must first be preached. Oh, honey, it matters what you're preaching. It matters what you're delivering. It matters what uh, your message consists of today because until we get it right and we get it around the globe. Jesus is held up in the heavens waiting on his people to get this thing right. Because not one jot nor one tittle of scripture 
will fail to come to pass until all these things be accomplished. That is the Word of God. This gospel must first be preached. I want to I want to read the same passage we read as our primary text today to you today, but I want to read it from the NIV, hoping it might deliver a little more clarity. It'll come across a little uh, more simply so that you can understand it. Genesis 11, 1 through 6 from the New International Version reads, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Simply meaning reaches to the sky. It doesn't mean reaching to where God, uh, where God's abode is. That would be, of course, impossible. Continuing, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. The power of one. The power of unity. The power of coming together. I want to tell you, uh, I used to preach myself years ago. I used to preach against a message of unity. Because I, like so many in the right wing fanatical church, believed that you know this was a slippery slope to a one world religion and one world, you know, so on and so forth. But I promise you today, that isn't even close to where I'm trying to go with this message. Unity, the power of one, or the power of oneness, the power of unity, is the most powerful thing we have in this world. Why do you think the Word of God said, why do you think Jesus Himself uttered the words, if two on earth shall agree, is touching any one thing? What did you need to do in order for God to hear and answer that prayer, you had to find unity. Hello now. You had to tap into the power of one. We sing the chorus, if two of you or three agree as touching anything, if you'll come to me as one, oh my goodness, it shall be done. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Oh, the power of oneness. If the church is ever to achieve its goals, if it is ever to do what God has called us to do, if we're ever going to be able to fulfill the full mandate of the gospel. You see, the full mandate of the gospel is not simply preach the gospel. Well, if that were all the mandate of the gospel uh, involved, if that's all God expected of us, then all kinds of denominations and organizations and fellowships and missions programs would fulfill that obligation. But Jesus told his disciples, he says, as you go, preach. He said, preach the gospel. But then he said, heal the sick cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Oh, but pastor, that was for them, that wasn't for me. Oh, honey, you are so wrong. Jesus said, go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples of every nation. Listen, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. 
Jesus said. Notice I'm quoting Jesus. I'm not quoting Paul, John, Peter, or, you know, or Francis somebody. I'm, I'm quoting the Lord. Jesus said in Mark, These signs shall follow them that believe. He didn't say these signs shall follow the Pentecostal church or this, these signs shall follow the apostolic church. He said these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Remember I said a little while ago, this gospel must first be preached? Oh, i got news for you, honey. This gospel includes healing the sick, cleansing the leper, raising the dead, and casting out devils. If you think it's anything less than that, i got news for you. You're wrong. The apostolic church in America today, the apostolic church in America, the Pentecostal churches in America today are so far from fulfilling the commandment of Christ. We are nothing like what we used to be. We're not even close to what we used to be. I'm not but going to be 55 years old in less than a month. And I can remember back to my youth and I remember people coming into the church of the living God. And I mean people broken, people sick, people suffering, people dying. And God would reach down and heal and deliver them. And they would go home whole, healthy, well. I've been pastoring for over 35 years starting my first church. At the age of 19. I know people, I see them online, I see them on Facebook that are still living today. That were healed of tumors, brain tumors. I know people that were healed. In churches I pastored of ovarian cancer. I know people that were healed of inoperable diseases and, and uh, inoperable conditions. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Nothing about Jesus changes. And when things are not going as they once went, you can bet it's not because Jesus has changed. The church doesn't preach the right message. The church does not get the right results. If we don't get our heads out of our backsides and start thinking straight, we will never, the Bible said, always striving, always striving to come into the unity of the faith. Does that mean, does unity of the faith mean that we'll always agree on every point of doctrine? No. No. Even in the earliest church there were differences. Paul wrote to the churches and said, I hear that there are divisions among you. This ought not to be. Some say I'm of Paul and others say I'm of Apollos. You see, Differences do not have to divide. Did you hear what I just said, church? Do you hear what I just said, America? Differences do not have to divide. There is one tool that man has at his disposal which allows him to access and to come into possession of the power of one. The power of unity. Listen to me now, children. You say, Pastor, I can't believe you got this out of that text this morning or this afternoon. Well, believe that it. it's there. When we all talk the same language, when I can talk and be understood and you can talk and be understood, it's amazing how you can achieve unity. Notice, 
everybody doesn't have to agree on everything. Everybody doesn't have to believe the same way. Everybody doesn't have to think the same way. But when you can effectively communicate, am I telling the truth? Isn't that what the condition was? Isn't that in our primary text? Isn't that where the world was at? They were effectively able to communicate. Do you know what puts division in between a husband and wife and ultimately often leads to a divorce court? Lack of or inability to effectively communicate. If those two people could learn to effectively communicate, guess what? There's a good probability they wouldn't wind up in front of a divorce judge. Do you know what causes families to become divided? Do you know what causes families to be wrought with confusion and with all kinds of angst and negativity? It is the inability to effectively communicate. If the child could speak and mother and dad could hear the child and understand the child, you don't have to agree with the child, but you need to be able to hear them and understand them. You need to be able to understand where they're coming from. You need to be able to understand what they're feeling. You need to be able to understand what they're going through from their perspective. Because, honey, you will never understand it so long as you're looking at it from your perspective. Effective communication is something that is imperative to the power of one. We live in a nation today that is divided like I have never seen this nation before at all because there's a demon, a demoniac, a wicked and evil man sitting in the White House who sows with his mouth every possible seed of division that he can sow. Am I telling the truth? You can speak to him and he has no clue what you're saying. He can talk to you and not one single thing he says is true or right. Am I telling the truth? Somebody that uses lies to divide and to separate, to set brother against brother. I've got news for you today, my friend. This is not a godly attribute. This is not anything that God honors, that God desires, or that God rewards. In Acts chapter 2, trying to move on with my message today. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them a trace. We wonder why we're not seeing the power of God moving in the church today as we once saw the power of God move. We wonder why we're not experiencing a move of the Holy Ghost like we ought to be experiencing. The answer is simple. Because in most churches today, you might get everybody in one place, but they're not all there for the same reason. Hello now. And pastors will spend all their time trying to convince people to stay. I know, I remember growing up in the church, I remember seeing people who did some of the dumbest things and said some of the most uh, impractical and the most uh, negative and destructive things. And yet the pastor 
would work overtime trying to make sure these people never left the church, that they didn't walk out and never come back. I remember seeing this at times. I know one pastor in East Texas that I loved dearly. I loved the man. But in my estimation, he was about the most weak and useless pastor I've ever laid my eyes on in my life. He had demoniacs in his church, literally. He had people in his church who did and said things that would destroy people and that would cause people to backslide and leave the church. And yet he did and said nothing, nothing ever to correct these people and set them on a right course. And if you don't want to get on the right course, then you need to get on another horse because, honey, you ain't going to this church. People wonder why Pastor Charles, your church has been so small for so many years. Yes, it has, because I've made the point abundantly clear that we don't just want to fill it up with people. We want to fill it up with people who can share our vision, who can share our burden, people with the same desires as we people with the same goal as we. I don't want to fill it up with people who are going to sit in the congregation every service wondering, well, I wonder where we're going to go out and eat after church today. I wonder, you know, if pastor's going to offer to buy my dinner today. We don't need people, Tommy, to come into the house of God who have not come here with one singular purpose, and that is to hear from heaven and to receive a word from the Lord and to experience the move of God. We don't have to agree on every point. If you want to believe that uh, Noah, uh, Jonah was swallowed by a big fish and I want to believe Jonah was swallowed by a whale, I've seen people argue about this. Who cares? Does that affect your salvation in the least? No, it does not. Therefore, is it important? No, it is not. Does it need to be argued or debated? No, it does not. Can we come into the house of God and work together toward the common cause and the common purpose of preaching the apostolic gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to everybody who will hear us? Yes, we can. Why? Because all the power of one requires is that we have a singular objective or a singular goal. See, right now in America, there's so much division, and Trump is feeding that division, and he is stirring up that division and that angst. And there's one goal that every American ought to have today. And that goal is this, to preserve and protect our nation. You see, just because somebody's born in America does not mean that they believe in the principles and the precepts set forth by our founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence, in our Constitution, in our Bill of Rights. Got news for you, honey. There are all kinds of people who live on American soil who have no use for our Constitution. Our Constitution does not serve them. Those people, yes, I'm going to say it, are called Republicans. The Republican Party has no use whatsoever for the Constitution of the United States of America. They have been striving for decades to be able to bring our nation to a place where we could discard it. And they could rewrite it after their own image and after their own desires. And when they are able to accomplish this, and never before in the history of humanity has America been closer to that day than it is today. When they rewrite it, they will rewrite it so that we no longer are a democracy, but we are an oligarchy. We are a bunch of paupers who serve at the pleasure of the rich. 
and there will be two classes in American society, the rich and the poor, the servant and the served. That is the goal of the Republican Party. In Donald Trump, they have the perfect leader. They have an individual who is so heartless and so without morals and so without spiritual scruples and integrity mm -hmm. that he will do what presidents of Republican stripe in the past would not do. You see, men like uh, Ronald Reagan, men like George W. Bush and George uh, H. W. Bush, the Republican machinery wanted them to go in certain directions in certain areas. But those men, although they were imperfect, and I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that I agree with everything they did or how they did things, I certainly don't. But those men had enough of a conscience and enough scruples in them that they just couldn't go the whole mile. They just couldn't eat the whole apple. They, they couldn't do everything the Republican Party wanted to do. I got news for you. Everything wrong that uh, Donald Trump's been doing for the last three and a half years, every single thing he's been doing, every single thing the Republican Party has wanted to do for decades. All these people who think that he is an apparition, that he is, uh, he came on the scene, and they don't know where he came from, they don't understand how he's doing all these things, and why Republicans won't stand up to him, and why they won't oppose him. Listen to me, stupid! It is because this is what they've wanted to do for decades! My God, wake up! Jesus, help us. Not only can, am I flabbergasted by the ignorance and stupidity of people who call themselves Christians on the right, but I'm equally as flabbergasted by the stupidity of people on the left who refuse to acknowledge that the Republican Party is completely and totally complicit. They are fully behind every single thing Trump has done. Don't sit there and say, when are Republicans finally going to stand up to you? When are Republicans... It ain't going to happen, honey. Nothing he's doing. Donald Trump had not got enough brains in his head to think of any of the things he's done. He doesn't. He has been led and guided by his Republican handlers. And baby, he is doing everything they want him to do. And that is why they will do everything in their power to keep him in office. And I don't mean for the next four years. I mean their plan is to keep him in indefinitely. And if you think any different, well, God have mercy on your soul. God's people experienced Pentecost. They experienced the birthday of the church when they found the power of one. They were all in one accord in one place. Psalm 133 verse 1 tells us, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 tells us, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. And if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, Two shall withstand him. In other words, if you're attacked by one person and you're alone, you're subject to being overtaken. But if there are two of you, you have a better chance of withstanding him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jesus Christ has not called his church to be argumentative. 
Jesus Christ has not called his church to be divisive. We are called to be good citizens. We're called, we're told to submit ourselves to those that have authority over us. We are told to obey the laws of the land. If the law of the land says that you're to provide everyone that comes into your business with service regardless of their skin color or regardless of their sexual orientation, I got news for you, honey. The word of God has given you an out. Because the word of God said, obey the laws of the land. You are not doing anything evil or wicked by baking a cake for a gay or lesbian couple. You're not doing anything wicked. You're not doing anything evil. You're not showing them uh, you support them or you know you support this, that, or the other thing. No, you are simply providing a service. And if you're smart, you'll bake it as good or better than you've ever baked any cake in your life. Because I got news for you, sweetie. Those LGBT people know a lot of straight people who are one day going to need a wedding cake or a baby shower cake or a birthday cake. Why is there a problem? I'll tell you why there's a problem. Because people who call themselves Christians are so foolish. And, and this whole subject matter just angers me out of my mind. If you wonder why I've got names flying off my lips today. Uh, this whole subject just frustrates me to no end. Does baking a cake for a gay couple require you to deny your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? No, it does not. So what's the problem? You see, the standard that we uphold is an idiotic and asinine and jackass standard. When somebody says, well, I can't make a cake for a gay couple because I don't agree with that. Oh, and do you agree with divorce and remarriage? Because you bake plenty of cakes for people who are getting married the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth time. funny how we pick and choose where we want to draw the line and where we want to uh, claim to possess a standard. No, the Word of God makes it abundantly clear. We're to obey the law of the land and we're not to deny our faith. If you can obey the law of the land without denying your faith, where is the problem? There is none. I have to drive speed limits. I can only go 55 on a road that's marked 55. I can't go 90. If I do, I'll be stopped and given a ticket. I can tell that cop all day and all night, well, I believe God, hallelujah. I believe God will protect me and God will keep me. I believe Jesus has got his hand on the wheel. Glory to God and I'm safe regardless of what speed I drive. And that cop's going to look at me and say, well, hallelujah, here's your ticket for $295. Let's stop being foolish, people. The standard is simple. If you are not being forced to or asked to deny your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're not being asked to renounce Him, then anything you might be asked to do within the law is acceptable. If that law says you must deny Him, then that law needs to be disobeyed. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Matthew 5, verse 25, Jesus is speaking. And he says, Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Oh, so you're telling me that Jesus did not encourage people to argue and debate and fight until they were finally arrested for their faith. 
No, he said the exact opposite. He said, agree with your adversary quickly. Come to terms with your adversary quickly. Why? Because you don't want to be arrested. You don't want to go to jail. You don't want to wind up in prison over something. Do you follow on that? That's what Jesus, that's not what Charles said. That's not what the pastor said. That's what the Word of God declares. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul writes, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men, or unregenerate, unsaved men? Division and strife and envy. These are all carnal traits. Paul said, no, 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 no. If you're acting like this, then you're walking as unsaved men. You're not acting like a child of God. A child of God didn't behave that way. Oh my goodness. Listen, Paul also tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 23, trying to hurry. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you, before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, you want to know if the Spirit's in somebody's life? Then this is the fruit you'll see growing on their tree. They don't have to make it grow, it'll be there. Fruit is not something you produce by thought or by process. Fruit is the natural byproduct of a healthy tree. Am I telling the truth? A child of God will produce these fruit if that child of God is healthy in the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. I'd love to see somebody point to a law that says that you cannot express love. You cannot possess joy. You cannot promote peace. You cannot be long-suffering. You cannot be gentle. You cannot be good. You cannot have faith. Hello now. Against such there is no law. I got news for you folks. A lot of these people in our world today, a lot of the people in the church today who are running around dividing and divisive and nasty and full of malice, those people are no more Christians than I am a billy goat. And that's a fact. Just because somebody calls himself a Christian, I can walk in a garage and call myself a Ford Model A. That doesn't make me a Ford Model A. The fruit of the Spirit. If the Spirit of God is in somebody's life, then this fruit will exist. It will manifest. It, they don't even have to make it manifest. It is the natural byproduct of a healthy tree. Romans 1, 28-32. Paul's writing about the evil and ungodly Roman Empire that existed in the first century. And he says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate. Deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, 
inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, meaning no matter how you try, you'll never satisfy them. No matter how hard you try to get them to quiet down, no matter how hard you try to make peace with them, you will never be able to do so because they are implacable. Unmerciful. My God, I just described Donald Trump. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. And this does not mean worthy of death in this life. Because all of these sins, nowhere within the law are all of these sins described as being uh, worthy of the death penalty. No, Paul is saying people who do this thing are worthy of spiritual death, hell, which is the second death. He's talking about eternity. He's not talking about death in this life. He said, Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. There's power in one. There's power in unity. There's power in coming together. There's power in working toward one end. People, including Christians, join organizations and groups every day, every day, which require them to unite around a common cause or a common purpose. Christians join PTAs, neighborhood associations. Oh, some of your neighbors are black, some of your neighbors are white, some of your neighbors are Muslim, some of your neighbors are Catholic, some of your neighbors are... Uh, Hindu but you belong to that neighborhood association PTA, some of the students are Muslim some of the students are raised by atheists, some of the students are Catholic some of the students are Protestant but you belong to that PTA why? because there's a common purpose and a common goal that you can agree upon, we want to make our education for our children the best it can be and you're willing to set aside those differences in order to work toward that common goal. Here's one. It's called the U.S. Army. People join the Army every day. You don't see them running around shooting at each other. You don't see black soldiers shooting white soldiers and white soldiers shooting black soldiers and Catholic soldiers shooting at uh, Muslim soldiers and Muslim soldiers shooting at uh, Protestant so so soldiers. No. Because there's power in one. And they're not stupid. And they know to lay aside. But we've got people in our church and we've got people in our nation who haven't got enough sense in their head to realize that we are making our nation weak. We are destroying it from within by not letting our differences not rule us, but rather uniting around the common cause. If we're all to be safe, if we're all to be secure, if the United States of America is to continue to be a shining city upon a hill, if, we are, if we're to continue to, to uh, be an example of freedom of press and freedom of religion and freedom of thought and ideas and the principles which were set forth by our founding fathers, then we cannot dwell in our differences nor can we fight and vie for control so that we can put things the way we want things ignoring how others feel and how others look at things. No. In order to achieve the power of one, there is always going to be a need for compromise. Husband, wife, you're never going to come together and experience the power of one if one of you or the other of you or if both of you are not willing to compromise. Children and parents, hello now, you are never going to experience the power of one in your home and in your family until somebody learns to compromise. Are you hearing me today? PTAs cannot function if someone is not willing to 
compromise. Neighborhood associations can offer. If you've ever served on a committee of any kind, you know that committees, I think committees are the worst idea anybody ever had because committees uh, just confound and confuse and compound the problem uh, trying to come to a conclusion. But ultimately, there has to be some compromise. We've got a nation full of people today. They want to run the show. They want to make things go the way they want them to go. And they refuse to compromise anything, anywhere, in any possible way in order to achieve that end. And they are going to destroy all of us. They refuse to to speak and to listen and to try to understand the other person from their perspective. They refuse. They're not interested. Well, we'll never as a nation know the power of one. And until we know the power of one, we are a sitting duck. Let this nation break out in civil war. See how quickly our adversaries will jump in. Because they'll see us in our weakness and they'll know they have an opportunity to take down the greatest nation on the face of the planet. Abraham Lincoln quoted from Mark chapter 3 verse 25. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand doesn't say might not stand, may not stand. It says that house cannot stand. Lastly today, I'm trying to close it right this minute. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies. Listen. And he that soweth discord among brethren. I want to tell you something, church. We've lost members in this local church body right here because there were people who sowed discord among brethren. We've lost people because there were those who spoke lies and accused falsely. I've got one fellow right now left our church and he's still in contact with some of our other church members and they've told me how that he's told them that I told him he's not welcome in this church any longer and those words never crossed my lips, never spoke them, never said them. That is a lie. That is a false witness. But he says that in an effort to convince these people of just how mean and how rotten Brother Charles is. Folks, I'm here to tell you today, our nation is in grave danger. We need to tap into the power of one. We've got people even, when you break things down, you know, you, you have organs and then organs break down to cells and, you know, and we have to be one at each and every one of these levels. So if we don't have the power to make our nation one at the moment, because there are people on the other side who just are not, they're implacable, they're not going to let that happen, then we need to be one as Democrats. We need to quit arguing and fighting and debating amongst ourselves. We need to quit griping and groaning about who the Democratic candidate is. All I know is that the Democratic candidate is not going to do the evil and wicked and divisive and nasty things that the current guy is doing. 
and I'm going to support that guy because that guy is going to do positive things. I don't have to agree with everything he believes. I don't have to agree with everything he wants to do. But I'll tell you one thing. I know the bad stuff that God hates and that God despises is the very things the guy at the top right now is doing. And I know that I'm going to support somebody who's going to do the exact opposite of that. Do you understand what I'm saying today? Folks, if the church is to be what the church is called to be, if the nation is to be today what this nation could be, we must tap into the power of one. Amen. Amen.